This is draft season. John Schmelk, Tony Pauline with you. Three weeks, believe it or not, until we get to the 2024 NFL draft. Draft season is brought to you by Moody's. Decode risk, unlock opportunity. Visit moody's.com to learn more. I am John Schmelk. My partner in crime is Tony Pauline. You can see all his work at sportskeeda.com. Tony, take us through your past week, what it's been like, the type of information you're gathering, and where you are at in terms of your process. Oh, thankfully I'm finishing up just a few more scouting reports, and then it's going to be, you know, maybe go back and watch some film if I have a differing opinion from other people to see if I'm missing something. And I usually find, you know, for all the people who are watching who, who are their own scouts, your first instinct is usually your best. Don't be swayed by what you read out there. But it's not a bad thing to double check. And then what will happen is uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the third is the final pro day. It's the Yale pro day. And their offensive lineman is supposed to be going to do some position drills. It'll be interesting to see what happens then. And then it's just work the phones. I mean, the uh, NFL teams will have their NFL draft meetings. All of the medical information will start to come out. And, I mean, there shouldn't be huge sways in draft boards unless somebody really has a bad medical or there's some red flag. We see all it with Aziz Ojolari, remember, all those years ago? Or there's some major character issues, uh, which comes out. Stuff is starting to leak out about certain players. But I, I don't, you know, unless there's something major like that, there won't be any huge change. It's just a matter of, and as we'll talk about when we do our, our first round mock, is where does the fourth quarterback go? Is the fourth quarterback going to go top five, top 10? Uh, you know, is he going to get to 11? That'll be one of the more interesting stories, which we won't know until draft night. Yeah, so we are doing our first mock draft today. We're going to go through some pro day stuff first. Then we're going to have our first mock draft since the combine, believe it or not. Um and then we'll have one more the week of the draft. Tony will give his final predictions. This is a predictive mock draft. What we think teams are going to do. We will allow trades. We'll see if any happen, but we will allow trades here as uh, we have our next to last mock draft of the draft cycle. Then the next two weeks, we'll give you our final top 10. Rank. T Tony will give you his top 10 ranks at each position. I don't think I'll be 10 deep at each position by then, but I will certainly critique comment and tell Tony why he's wrong. And then he'll say, Schmelk, shut up. I do more work than you. And I'll say, okay, that's a fair point. And those will be our next two shows along with questions from, uh, from fans as well. And then we get to draft week and we're rocking and rolling. So Tony, here we go. Let's do pro days. Let's start yeah. with LSU. Yeah. I love you list there. You have the guys you want to talk about for the pro days. LSU, you just say everyone. Yeah. Your thoughts. What, what, what have you heard about the LSU pro day? I mean, it was basically a, an outstanding pro day, except for two guys really didn't stand out. And Jaden Daniels was one of those guys that really didn't stand out. He didn't have a bad pro day. It was more a Caleb Williams pro day. He missed on a few passes, but he showed great arm talent. The biggest criticism that I heard about Jaden Daniels during his pro day, and I wrote about it, was the fact that people, it seemed like he didn't know the script and he had to go, kept going back to see what was next, what was next, which people found unusual. I don't think it's a needle mover. I still think he's going to go to the, to the commanders with the arm strength he showed through a lot of nice deep passes. Obviously, you know, with Jaden Daniels, you may, may, you, may have, you may have hoped for a better pro day. Just watch the film. He's a gamer. Charles Turner also struggled. Charles Turner ran 140, hurt his hamstring. The 40 was timed in like 5-5-3. Five, five, uh, Didn't really do anything the rest of the day. So I think in a draft that is not deep at center, Charles Turner had an opportunity to help himself. The hamstring issue is going to hold him back. After that, I mean, you know, we talked about Malik Neighbors, and I mentioned the story how I spoke with one team personnel person, uh, person and – he said that the best vertical threats were Xavier Worthy and Troy, oh, Xavier Worthy, Texas, Troy Franklin of Oregon. I said I would put Malik Neighbors in that uh, conversation. And he wasn't too sure about Malik Neighbors. He said he wanted to see how he ran. If Malik Neighbors didn't run at Pro Day, they're going to put him down as a 4 5, 4 5, 5 back. Well, Malik Neighbors ran. <laughs> he ran fast. I mean, he was 4 3 5. His, I think his vertical jump was 42 inches. Just had an insane athletic workout, uh, caught the ball very well. He was outstanding. Their two defensive linemen, Jordan Jefferson, the nose tackle, Mecky Wingo, the uh, one gap three technique uh, lineman, both had uh, terrific workouts, moved incredibly well. Teams are very impressed with them. 
Jordan Jefferson, I think, helped himself because of three, six, 316 pounds. He's basically slated to be a nose tackle, but he moved incredibly well. So you, you'd think that he could be a, uh, you know, a playmaker. Omar Speets, the linebacker who really doesn't get a lot of mention, transferred from Oregon State. If you're watching him Oregon State, he was just a playmaker, playmaker. Had uh, Did some good things at, uh, at LSU last year. There was some question about his speed. People were wondering if he was a high 4'7 guy, ran 4'6'2", tested well. And for a guy like Omar Speets, those testing numbers mean a lot because, like I said, the expectations for Speets are he's a 4'7 guy. He runs in the low 4'6s. You know, people know now that they can use him more as a more than just a two-down, in-the-box type of linebacker. No, I'm with you. Good information there, Tony. Then the day after, you had competing pro days, which I'm sure made NFL talent evaluators thrilled that they couldn't go to both. North Carolina were Drake May, and then, of course, you had Washington with their large array of prospects. Let's start with UNC. I mean, Drake May, I thought I was, I was told, threw the ball very well. And I was told that his teammates said that it was the best they had ever seen Drake May. I know through this process that personnel, people, scouts, and GMs have been grilling uh, Drake May's teammates about the quarterback, trying to get in to see what they, you know, what his, what they thought about the the downfalls, the pitfalls of his game were. And the teammates were honest, but I'm told he stood out on pro day. I, I mean, he was throwing terrific passes down the field. He was accurate. I was told the timing uh, looked very well. What was I'm sorry, the timing was on time with his passes. Walker, the receiver. Also caught the Devontae's Walker, also uh, caught the ball well. Very smooth, very fluid running routes. I think Walker understands that he's got to make up for that senior bowl performance that we were at where he was getting separation, but he was also dropping a lot of passes. And he's had to show people in the, in the at the combine, at the pro day, in the run-up to the draft, that that was the exception to the rule, all those passes that he dropped at the senior bowl. You know, he's more of a natural pass catcher. It'll be interesting to see with Devontae Walker, physically talented, good film. You have the senior ball performance. You also have the issues that he had to move back closer to home. So I'm sure that's something that's going to bring up a lot of questions uh, for NFL scouts. How about Washington? Washington, I, I think the big winner, I thought I was told that Penix uh, threw the ball very well. He's got a great deep arm. He was on the money downfield. Uh, McMillan and Polk both caught the ball well. Adunze did nothing really, just sat on the sidelines, sat on his performance from the combine. But Pe- I was told that Penix did well, the receivers did well. The guy who really stood out was Dominique Campton, the safety, because he ran faster than expected at the combine. He ran in a low four fives where people thought he was more of a four six guy. He was timed as fast as four three nine at the pro day. So a lot of people having the low four fours, but there were some four three nines. He had great shuttle times at, and call, three cone times at the combine. Again, go back to what I said about Omar Speech. The testing is really off the charts with this guy. He's beating expectations. And I spoke with somebody yesterday. They think that Dominique Campton right now is a top five safety in the draft. The film is outstanding. I mean, he was more of a downhill guy, but he was smart, kept the action in front of him, didn't have mental lapses. You match the film, the mental acumen you see on the film with the testing numbers, and now you're talking about a guy that, you know, people are talking about six-round area. He's now in the fourth-round area. And with his size and his testing numbers and a draft that is not deep in safety at all, he could go third round. And, Tony, I think the number one safety in this class is wide open. I think it could be any of three yeah. or four guys. And one of them is safety Jaden Hicks, who did yeah. not do much at the Combine, but he showed out at the Washington State Pro Day. Four four seven. I was told at the uh, by scouts who were there. I heard some four four six, or I read some four four sixes. But again, sort of like Dominic Camp and Jaden Hicks is a bigger guy, almost looks like a small linebacker in center field. The question of, about him was speed. He doesn't show great speed on film. He, run, he runs a four four six, four four seven. You start wondering if it's the system, or you just got to coach him to play to that speed. And I agree with you. Hampton is a guy who probably helped himself at least a full round with those tech, testing numbers. Jaden Hicks is a guy who helped himself at least a half around and is now in conversation to be the first overall safety selected somewhere, maybe late round two. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that's when the first save, I think that I don't, I'm not sure if there's a safety picked in the first 40 picks in this draft. I think 
probably more likely after 45 or 50. Uh, I, th- I imagine they'll start going off around the same time as the first running back goes off the board, to be totally honest with you. Maybe even the first linebacker, depending on when Cooper or, or Peyton Wilson goes. Finally, uh, Graham Barton, who was dealing with, uh, I believe it was some kind of upper body injury, Tony, so he couldn't do much at the combine. I'm not sure if that's been detailed exactly what the injury is. Uh, timed well. Uh, give me your thoughts on Graham Barton. And frankly, he looked very lean because he ran with the shirt off. And I'm like, wow, that dude's an offensive lineman. He's a pretty lean dude for a guy that you think is going to be a, a center or a guard or, or a tackle. Right. Well, play tackle at Duke, projects to the inside, either center or guard, 4.95 in the 40. The the uh, shuttle times that I had was uh, 4.55 five for the short shuttle, 7.32 for the three cone, both outstanding numbers. What you would expect from a lean offensive lineman, right? You expect them to move very well, both in a straight line and laterally. He did it. Uh, did a lot of position drills at center, snapped the ball, looked solid. Now, again, it's a projection. You know, you, you, here's a guy who play, primarily played left tackle. You project him on the inside. You project him to center. It's a whole different thing. But I'm told during position drills, he looked outstanding. And, you know, everyone said coming out of it that he they believe that he has cemented himself as a late first round pick, depending on where if Jackson Powers Johnson goes to the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Miami Dolphins are selecting right after them. Miami Dolphins need an interior offensive lineman. Maybe that's a good place for Grant Barton because he showed so well during pro day. And he's been highly thought of in the, in the scouting community. I mean, I had heard prior to the combine that there was a lot of chatter about him. A lot of people like him. Yeah. And you know, I, we were big fans of him too, Tony, at the beginning of the process, we were talking about him back. He was on one of our, he was on our preseason watch list. So uh, big fan of Graham Barn. I think will be a first round pick. I know the Dallas Cowboys are apparently high on him too, uh, hoping he might get to them at twenty four. I'm not sure he will, but that's something we'll have to keep an eye on. A really versatile player, uh, good player, safe pick. All right, let's get to our mock draft, Tony. Uh, we're gonna go every other pick here. We're gonna go odds even. So you're gonna take odds. I'm gonna take evens. Um, we went through the needs the last two weeks, so we're not gonna focus on needs necessarily when you go through these picks. We'll try to focus more on what we think they're gonna do in the players. Uh, so let's get this going. Tony, you're on the clock for our next to last draft season mock draft, the Chicago Bears at first overall. Uh, this is easy. I mean, Caleb Williams. Uh, th- this is the one pick that everybody's going to have right, right? I mean, uh, they trade Justin Fields. They got Caleb Williams. He's already already ingrained himself in that the organization. The word is that the teammates like him. Uh, you, you know, he had Keenan Allen out there in his pro day. Uh, I mean, if there's any sort of thing as a take it to the bank pick, it's Caleb Williams to the Chicago Bears with the first selection. All right, command is at number two. I think this is quarterback as well. If I was making the pick, I would select Drake May. But this, based on what I'm hearing out there from people that I trust more than others, they seem to be leading Jane and Daniels here. But I think the commanders, Tony, have done a good job of holding the cards close to their vest and not really making it obvious who they're picking. But I'll slide Jane and Daniels in here as pick number two. And he's a good fit for that Cliff Kingsbury system. Uh, third pick, the New England Patriots. I'm going to throw a curveball here. If you read my mock draft at the uh, at Sports Skeeter, which was released on Monday. Well, Tony, I mean, hold on. Think- but, 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 but before you make the pick then, would you uh, be willing to trade down from this pick? Sean Payton is going to offer you three first-round picks. His first round this year, his first round next year, and his first round pick in 2026 to move up to number three? I'm going to say no, only because, you know, I look at it, are you going to get a good offensive tackle? Maybe you get a good pass rusher there. You don't know what the quarterback market is going to be. I think the Patriots would absolutely consider it, and this is what I reported at the Combine, they would absolutely consider trading down. But from what I'm hearing recently, that Elliot Wolf, the de facto GM, is in love with J.J. McCarthy. And they feel that they know quarterbacks, and they love quarterback. They know how to develop quarterbacks. So with the third pick of the draft, I'm sure the phone's going to be ringing off the hook, as it will be with the fourth pick of the draft. Well, I'm going to throw a curveball here based on what I've been hearing last week. And with the third pick of the draft, the New England Patriots are going to take J.J. McCarthy of Michigan. I wouldn't make that. I wouldn't select this player, but that's what I'm hearing. Love it. All right, now the phone, now the Arizona Cardinals. Yep. I'm Austin Ford right here, and my phone's ringing, baby. Yep. My phone is ringing. I'm getting the Vikings, uh, I'm assuming, at 11 with the Vikings. Tony, you're calling me. I got yep. the Broncos at 12. They're calling me. I'm already sitting here with two first-round picks on the Arizona Cardinals. I'm already selecting on number four. I'm selecting also at number 27. 
And I'm running the draft right now with Drake May on the table. Heck, maybe even the New York football giants with Drake May on the board, who's kind of a mini Josh Allen type of prospect. Maybe Brian Dable. And I get this is not me reporting anything, folks. Do not aggregate me. Maybe the Giants would be interested in, in moving up a couple spots to grab a quarterback. So let's talk this out, Tony. We can make this like a team pick. What do you think the Cardinals are thinking here at number four? Do you think they're locked in on a guy like Marvin Harrison, or do you think they would be willing to move out of here and select the quarter and uh, and and forego that top pick and just keep stocking picks? Yeah, I, I think that they're absolutely going to. And I was, prior to last week, I thought going to be Marvin Harrison. They got two first-round picks. And then from what I'm hearing is they're going to entertain offers because they could probably get a real good receiver at number 11. You know, if they're not locked in on Marvin Harrison, and as I've said, in my opinion, Marvin Harrison has made a lot of mistakes in the run-up to the draft. You're not, you shouldn't tell people who are going to invest tens of millions of dollars into you, you won't do certain things, the things that Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors have done. So I, I think that, you know, if the Giants offer is strong, they would probably consider that because they could move to six, probably still end up with Marvin Harrison. But I think with Minnesota, with two first-round picks in this year's draft, they can move down to 11. They'll have three first-round picks. And even in a worst-case scenario, at 11, they're looking at either Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, maybe even Brock Bowers. So they're going to get their playmaking pass catcher at 11 and still come away with another first-round pick. I mean... Martin okay, so Harris I'm going to put this at you. I'm going to put this at you then. If you're the Cardinals, I'm going to give you a set of offers from three different teams. You tell me which one you think is the best offer that they're most likely to take. Would you take the Giants offering their first overall pick next year and then maybe like a mid-round pick at some point this year or next? Or would you prefer the Hall from Minnesota or Denver, which would be three ones? You're dropping further. You're trading out of Adunzie and, and Harrison and neighbors, but you're getting a lot of picks. What, what, where do you think Arizona would lean there? Would they lean just dropping down two and getting less, or they want to get the Hall and drop down to 11 or 12? But the question is, if they move to 11, are you out of the market for any of those three receivers? Obviously, two will, two of them will likely be gone, but there's a very good chance with the four, with four quarterbacks going one, two, three, four, one of those receivers is going to fall to you at 11. And if one of those receivers don't fall to you at 11, you can get Brock Bowers. Yes, Still, I, you know, I, I would feel confident one of those four playmakers would be there. I would feel I, good I, about I could, that. I would say two. I would say possibly Bowers and and one of one of the receivers. Um, I think because football is such a, a here and now game, it, it depends. If I was, if they are sold on Marvin Harrison, you're making that trade with the Giants. And you will find out why with the Los Angeles Chargers pick, picking up next. If they are sold on him. But again, I, I think Malik Neighbors is more explosive than Marvin Harrison. I don't want to say Roma Dunze is a safer pick, but he's done everything teams have asked to, of him you know, in the lead up to the draft. Brock Bowers didn't run because he's got the ankle injury, but still we saw what he did in the SEC. I would make the trade with the Minnesota Vikings get their two first round picks because the way I see the board, the Cardinals will be able to fill defensive needs in the bottom third of round one. Those defensive needs being a cornerback and a pass rusher. So rather than get future picks, I'm going to load up on picks this year. I like this year's first round. I have more players with first round grades this year than I have in the past. Yep. So if Minnesota comes to me who says, we're going to give you the 11th pick and our other pick in, in the first round for your fourth pick so we can move up and get the quarterback. I'm making that trade uh, if I'm the Arizona Cardinals. Okay, so that's what we'll do. Minnesota will trade up to four, Tony. So you are now on the clock here uh, for the Vikings at four. Let me see. The Vikings then are going to pick at 11 and 23. So I will let you then. I the will Cardinals take the Vikings are, the pick here, picking, and then yeah. you can control the Cardinals. Yeah, the Cardinals are picking at 11, 23, and 27 with that trade. All right, so I will let you control the Cardinals. I'll take this Vikings pick then, and obviously the selection then would be Drake May. I think you put him with Kevin O'Connell. I think that is just going to be a really, really nice start 
uh, to what they're doing here. All right, you're up here, Tony. Quarterbacks one through four, first time that it's ever happened in an NFL draft. Let's go to the Chargers at five. What are you thinking? Or are you on the phone trying to trade down? Yeah, you know, the Chargers will definitely look to trade down. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, they, they need draft picks. They, they got devastated because of the uh, uh, due to the salary cap issues. But again, you know, if you remember what I said last week about uh, Michigan Pro Day and how these players, the, the players from Michigan, came across as incredibly intelligent, and I said that the Los Angeles Chargers under Jim Harbaugh, I believe they will win a Super Bowl within three years. You're looking at it. you got Marvin Harrison there. you got Malik Neighbors there. They do need another receiver, even though they took Quentin Johnson in the first round. But I think Joe Alt is just a natural fit here, unless somebody uh, gives him an incredible offer. And I don't see that happening, considering all the quarterbacks are off the board. So I'm going to go with Joe Alt because they need an offensive tackle. He's a big athletic guy. He's a smart guy. He's basically a Jim Harbaugh type of lineman. And we saw the incredible success that Harbaugh had at Michigan, basically with offensive linemen. I like the playmaker here, but you've got an all-pro quarterback. You better be able to protect him. You know, I know they've got uh, Rashawn Slater at left tackle. I've said it all along. I do believe that Joe Alt can be a right tackle, and I think he'd be a very good right tackle in the league. All right. Joe Alt, number five. Interesting. Now, the Giants go at number – I wonder, by the way, if they're going to uh, slide Slater to the right side or keep him on the left side and put Alt there or, or how they're going to work that with the two tackles. But certainly, bookend tackle is not a bad way to go here for the Chargers. All right, New York football Giants at number six. And there was a good faith effort made to trade up to number four to try to get Drake May when he, when he, when he dropped there. Didn't work out. The Vikings came with too rich of a package. But Marvin Harrison Jr. is still on the board. I'm going to pull my hamstring, Tony, running up to the phone to call into the league office and call into my guy with the card at the draft to hand in the card that says Marvin Harrison Jr. He's six four, but he runs like a guy that's six foot. He's a great route runner. He's got good hands, makes contested catches, gets open, gets separation, has deep speed, checks all the boxes, maybe not the best run after catch guy, if there's one thing that you can do the minor nick on, but no, it, he's still really good at that too. So this is an easy one for the Giants at six. Marvin Harrison Jr. and I think everyone in East Rutherford would be would be quite happy with that selection. And if Marvin Harrison Jr. gets past the uh, gets past the Cardinals at four, you know that the the temperature in the in the Giants war room or Giant draft parties around New York and New Jersey is going to start to rise. They're going to start to uh, start to hope or pray that uh, Marvin Harrison falls to them, which I think is a possibility. Here's a question, Tony, real quick. If Harrison's available at five, you talked about the Chargers would be looking to trade down. What team or Eames do you think would be willing to move up for Harrison? Do you think the Bears would think about that from nine to try to pair him with Caleb? I think that would definitely be a possibility. How about I'm the sure Jets? That, would the I Jets say the hell with say, it? I was going to. I was going to say the Jets <clears throat> would, would probably consider it. I, I think the thing is, is you know, are you willing to give up <clears throat> extra selections to move up to get Marvin Harrison when you can get Roma Dunze or the right, neighbors? Right. You know, that's. I think that's what you have to consider uh, if, if that is a situation. I think there may be some calls. I don't. It's not. I don't think any team is going to offer a huge deal, except for maybe the Jets that are in a win-now mode and, and really aren't worried about 2025, 2026. Fair enough. All right, you're up at number seven with the Titans, Tony. Sorry for interrupting. It's okay. I, you know, I, I know this guy has kind of fallen off the radar for, for the longest time now. Uh, people seem to be knocking him. Uh, one thing I do know is a concern. It, it's something, if you look at the combine list, he only had eight-and-a-half-inch hands. Uh, but they, the Titans uh, – Signed Calvin Ridley in free agency. So they, they filled the need at receiver. I'm going to go with Olu Fashanu of uh, Penn State because I don't think a guy goes from being, you know, a top five pick, you know, for two years running to all of a sudden he's a mid first round choice, you know, two weeks after the combine, a week after the combine. Uh, I, I love his, his skills and pass protection. I love his mobility. 
his footwork, his movement skills. You, They hope that they have their quarterback of the future, their franchise quarterback in Will Levis. you got to protect him. And while Fashano needs to improve his playing strength, needs to improve his run blocking, he is an outstanding pass protector. And I think he's a natural fit to be an early starter at left tackle for the Titans. All right. I like it. Olu Fashion, number seven, the Tennessee Falcons at eight. Tony, I think this is where you probably get your first defensive player coming off the board. I just don't think the Falcons will pick uh, a wide receiver, which I think is clearly the best available player right now, whether it's Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze or Brock Bowers, if you want to go that way. But they have all these other high level wide receivers and pass uh, pass catching weapons. So I don't think the Falcons go there. So I'm going to go very chalky here. I'm going to go Dallas Turner. Uh, he tested the well of all the the edge guys, and I just think he's you know he doesn't have the the lot two issues with the medicals versus an older guy. He's not quite as athletic, so I'll go Dallas Turner here for the Falcons. Though I do wonder if a corner, whether it's Quinion Mitchell or it's Terry and Arnold, could sneak into the top ten here. Or I think you know by pure grade might be better than Dallas Turner. I just think people value the edge player a little bit more, so I'm going to go Turner to the Falcons. It makes sense. I know for a fact that they like him. I, I mean, the question with the Falcons is, if one of the ta- one of the quarterbacks happens to slide down, would they be willing to trade down? You know, say twelve Denver or Minnesota, they could probably still trade down to uh, Minnesota and, and end up with Dallas Turner because I don't see uh, maybe the Bears at nine could take uh, an edge rusher. Uh, the Jets aren't going to take an edge rusher. Or you never know. Uh, but I, I think the, the only way that that pick isn't Dallas Turner is that the Falcons trade down. The Chicago Bears are up. You're still looking at two really good, outstanding receivers. They didn't make the trade for Keenan Allen. I'm looking at the tight end board. They signed Gerald Everett, who's a nice number two tight end. You got Cole Komet there. Really tough to pass up on Brock Bowers. I mean, he is a Chicago Bear type of player. He's a playmaker at the tight end position. You bring in Caleb Williams. You want to protect him. None of the offensive tackles on the board really excite me. But you also want to give him targets to throw the ball to. And Brock Bowers is an outstanding target. You got Keenan Allen, DJ Moore there at receiver. Probably Tyler Scott, who's your speed guy. Need an underneath tight end that can also stretch the middle of the field. In my opinion, this is a great fit, and this is the way you build your franchise, or at least the offensive side of your franchise moving forward. So the Bears are going to take Brock Bowers. Wow, over Adunze and Neighbors, I like it. Now the Jets at 10, Tony, and this is a tough decision. Is it wide receiver or offensive tackle? That's what we're looking at, right? And I think the best player by pure grade on the board is going to be wide receiver. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to be involved in these conversations. He already has a Garrett Wilson, who I think is more similar to neighbors, in my opinion, than probably to a Dunze. So I'm going to go. And here's the thing. They have two veteran tackles, but can you trust them to stay healthy? They have Elijah Vera Tucker. You can move out there if you want. Give me your Jets perspective, Tony, before I make this pick. Do you think you're leaning wide receiver or tackle? I would lean tackle if Fashanu's there. I, I don't know that any of the offensive tackles are rated high enough on my board right now to take an offensive tackle over Neighbors or Dunze. If Fashanu's there, considering that you got Tyron Smith for a year and you don't even know if you're going to have him for a year, considering when you look at the injury history, I'm taking for Shadow because of the way I have him rated on the board and the fact that, you know, the last time the Jets took a uh, an offensive tackle in the top 10 was DeBrickashaw Ferguson, and he was a terrific left tackle for them for uh, 12 years. If the Shadow's there, in my opinion, that's got to be the pick. Otherwise, where you're looking here, I, I mean, as I said last week, there are only, only good things can happen to the Jets to 10, and there's a lot of good options for them. They're going to have to go out of their way to, to uh, make a mistake. Um, from looking at it from a character perspective and from a guy that you can insert in and the safer player, I think that's Roma Dunze. If you're looking for the more explosive wide out, then that's Malik Neighbors. Yep. I already typed it into my spreadsheet. I'm going to go Roma Dunze. I think he fits better in their wide receiver room. And I think it'll be a guy that Aaron Rodgers with that size, much like with Devontae Adams, 
uh, would would like to throw the football to. So I'm going to go with Roman Dunze to the Jets at number 10. And Tony, you made the right choice, or we did, with the Cardinals trading down to 11, because look who's staring them right in the face here. Yeah, but I mean, even if Brock Bowers is there, that's a great pick for him. If if the Jets take an Armand draft, the Jets take Malik Neighbors, you got Roma Dunze. Oh, they're still they're looking at Malik Neighbors, a guy who's explosive, a guy who can separate, a guy who's a big play receiver, a guy who's shown consistent improvement the past two seasons. Uh, I I mean, it fits. Uh, you know, it's like a duck in water. And, and I'm, I've been told, and we were talking about this before the show. There is some concern that Malik Neighbors may have a little trouble in a bigger city. I don't think Arizona is the type of place that's a bigger city. I think it's a good fit for him. Excellent you know, weather, basically same weather as what he played at in LSU. So I, I think, uh, you know, the Cardinals made that trade. They got their receiver. Some have Malik Neighbors rated higher than uh, Marvin Harrison, if you believe reports. Possibly could be true. If Malik Neighbors keeps his focus on the field and just shows a lot of maturity as a person, this is going to be a great pick for the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, I think that's an easy one, too. So to 11, first 11 picks, Tony, 10 of them offensive players. The only defensive player in there in Dallas Turner. The other players are the four quarterbacks to lead it off. Williams, Daniels, McCarthy, May. Joe, all five to the Chargers. The Giants fall into Marvin Harrison, Jr. Tennessee Titans, Olu Fashionu. Dallas Turner to the Falcons and Brock Bowers to the Bears. Roma Dunze to the Jets and Malik Neighbors to the Cardinals in that trade with the Vikings. Let's go. Number 12, the Denver Broncos, Tony. And boy, Sean Payton tried. He offered three first-round picks to go up and get that quarterback. He really made an effort. He just couldn't get it done. And I know they're desperate, Tony. But after re-watching the quarterbacks, I cannot convince myself to pick Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix here. I can't do it. I just can't. And I did that in our last mock, right? I think I gave the Raiders Penix, right? Or something like that. I just can't believe Sean Payton will watch these guys and say, these are first round quarterbacks. I just don't think he'll get there. I think he's too smart. So I think the Broncos have needs at corner and edge on defense. I think the corner's the better player here, but I know Sean Payton, and I don't know if this was him drafting in New Orleans or if it was the GM drafting in New Orleans. They like to draft big people in the first round. So I'm kind of going back forth here between Quinny and Mitchell. They already have Patrick Sertan Jr. there, who's a great corner. Or do I go with one of the edge players? All right, I'm going to go because they, Sean Payton tend to like big power rushers and bigger guys at edge in New Orleans. So I'm going to go Jared Versier to the Denver Broncos at number 12. That makes complete sense. Phil's a need. Outstanding player. Uh, I think a bit underrated. The only reason that he's fallen as far is because so many offensive players, specifically the quarterbacks and the off- and the receivers, have gone early on. So I am up with the Las Vegas Raiders. I think they can go in a variety of ways. And cornerbacks, a, uh, a consideration here. But they really need to shore up their right tackle spot. So I'm going to go with uh, Talise Fuaga of Oregon State. Some teams project Fuaga at guard, but I think he's a big, nasty, power-blocking tackle who moves relatively well that really fits the Raiders system. I think it's a guy that Antonio Pierce, the head coach, is going to love. Yeah, all right, let's go um, New Orleans Saints at 14 here, Tony. And again, they like to draft people up front. They like to draft big people. They have a need on the defensive line. They have a need on the offensive line. And the Ryan Ramchek injury, where he might not be able to play this year, that's a big problem. But I want a guy that gives them some flexibility. So I'm going to go and stay out there in the Pac-12. I'm going to give them Troy Fatanu from Washington that can play offensive tackle. He can play guard if they need it. He's big, he's physical, his tape's awesome, his testing's great. You can't go wrong. I'm going to go, I thought about Amarius Mims here. Because the Saints like big, physical, traitsy, athletic tackles, and I think Mims fits that really well. But I'll go with the safer pick here. I'll go with Troy Fatano. I agree with you. I mean, Ramchek, who knows if he's going to be back? I mean, he said at the end of the season, his career was in jeopardy, and, and you know, it hasn't gotten any better. Penning? The kid that they took from Northern Iowa a couple of years ago has not panned out for them at left tackle. So, I, I mean, there's almost a need there for two offensive tackles. I had yeah. them taking Fatanu in my uh, mock draft. Uh, I wrote about him. I, I'm told that he was outstanding during uh, Pro Day. 
He's really a guy who, because of his versatility, to play multiple positions on the offensive line, a lot of people like. Uh, so I I agree. I, I, I think that's a good selection. Indianapolis, I think when the Colts are called to the clock, it's going to come down to one or two players. It's going to be either Terry and Arnold or Quinion Mitchell. Terry and Arnold, I, I like it because, you know, he can play a lot in nickel. But Quinion Mitchell, in my opinion, has done everything right in the pre-draft process. People say, well, he comes from the MAC. They don't have great talent there. As we saw, he went to the Senior Bowl and was dominant for three days. You interviewed him. He said he wanted to set world records uh, at the combine. Maybe he didn't set world records, but he tested incredibly well. Showed the ability you know, to play press coverage uh, at the Senior Bowl and do it very well. So in my opinion, it's going to be one of the two cornerbacks. I look at Mitchell. I like the size and speed, and I like the fact that he's done so well in press coverage at the Senior Bowl. I'm taking the Colts take Cornyon Mitchell. That's who I had too. And remember, they just re-signed Kenny Moore to play the slot for them. So I don't think the Arnold slot versatility is as, as important to them, Tony. So I'm with you. I think Mitchell all the way. All right, Seahawks at 16. John Schneider likes to pick defensive linemen. They need defensive linemen. I know some people have talked about offensive line here, but I think they have their two young offensive tackles. I think they're good with those guys. I'm not willing to, to, to force something here. Uh, there's one good edge rusher less left, and I think they want to kind of get that last top edge rusher. I'm going to go lay to Latu here uh, to the Seahawks at number 16. I have them taking a uh, an edge rusher. As we all know, I have a uh, a man crush, if you will, on Chop Robinson. I think <laughs> Latu, it's going to come down to the uh, to the medicals, but I, I do agree that it's going to be a uh, an edge rusher. You know, I wonder the interesting thing with Seattle, Tony, and this, I'm just thinking about this now. I wonder if they have any relationship with the same doctors that Washington university uses. They're both being in the Pacific Northwest. So maybe they might have some insight into the lot two injury that maybe some other teams might not. Anyway, go ahead. There you go. Jacksonville Jaguars are on the clock. They franchise Josh Allen in the postseason. They signed Gabe Davis. I really want to put a receiver here. I really want to put, Ryan Thomas uh, of LSU here, but I'm looking at that offensive line. Cam Robinson has got one year left on the deal. They got Anton Harrison playing right tackle when he is a natural left tackle. So I'm going to go with the Marius Mims because I think you've got to fortify that offensive line. You've got Trevor Lawrence there. He's your quarterback of the future. What's going to happen with Cam Robinson after this year? Is he going to be able to stay healthy throughout the full season? I think a Marius Mims does a couple things. It gives them a real good, strong pass blocking, run blocking, right tackle. And then you can take Anton Harrison and move him back to his natural spot at left tackle. This is a pick as much for the future as it is for right now. No, I think that's a good pick. I had offensive tackle, wide receiver, and then corner as well as kind of my three choices there uh, for them. And I think picking the offensive tackle, even though they seem to be okay now, I think trying to protect Trevor Lawrence long-term, we've seen that's been a problem for them. So I think it is a good idea for them to try to shore up that pass protection. Speaking of shoring up pass protection, Tony, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals at number 18, they lose Jonah Williams. Uh, they have Orlando Brown on the left side, but who's the starting right tackle? I don't feel good about their options. And J.C. Latham, a plug-and-play right tackle, is sitting on the board. I think this is an easy one for me. J.C. Latham to the Bengals. Absolutely. I mean... It'll be interesting to see where Latham goes in comparison to Marius Mims, even in comparison to Waga, because he is a natural right tackle. We talked about him early on with the size, but I think this is this is a, a perfect fit. Los Angeles Rams are up. Aaron Donald uh, basically announced his retirement, which I think caught some people by surprise. You look at their defensive line. Kobe Turner last year, third-round pick, terrific player. Deshaun Johnson from Toledo. A good story, seventh round pick. I, you know, I, I don't know about uh, Johnson being a starter moving forward. So I'm going to go with Byron Murphy of Texas. I know he's a little bit smaller, but he's strong. He's athletic. You, you know, they, they play a 3 4, but they play their pass rushers, their outside linebackers up on the line of scrimmage. So it's almost a one gap sort of 3 4 system, which I think Byron Murphy would be perfect in. I think with losing Aaron Donald, you got to basically fill in that piece. I don't know that you can go with Johnson as your starter throughout the season. So, so the Rams take Byron Murphy. I would consider corner there too, Tony, just yeah. because Terry and Arnold's still there. And I think he's a really good value here, but I think this is right where Byron Murphy is going to get picked. So I think 
Rams are going to pick a defensive player. It's just a matter of what defensive player it's going to be, and I think they get really good value here with Murphy. All right, Steelers are number 20, Tony. Uh, they have issues on the offensive line, uh, offensive tackle, interior offensive line as well. Uh, I think they could use another receiver uh, to replace Deontay Johnson, but the Steelers just pick great wide receivers in the second round. They don't need to pick one in the first round. They'll just wait to the second round, and they'll be fine. So I'm going to push the wide receiver aside. I'm going to look at the offensive lineman here, and – I think they're going to want someone that gives them some versatility and can move around a little bit. So I thought about Jackson Powers Johnson here, but I'm going to go a guy you mentioned earlier in the program who had a great pro day. I'm going to give him Graham Barton at a Duke. Again, blue collar, tough player. I think he'll fit really well in Pittsburgh with what they like to do. So I'm going to give the Steelers Graham Barton at a Duke. And he can slide in it at tackle if they want to move Broderick. Jones over to left tackle and put him at right. They can do whatever they want with him. It gives them options. So I'm going to give them Graham Barton Steelers at 20. Well, two things. You proved early what I said is that his pro day basically cemented Graham Barton as a first-round pick. And I think that Miami Dolphin fans are jumping for joy because the guy that you passed on, Jackson Powers Johnson, I think is the guy that really fills a need for them because they could use help at guard. They could use help at center. Jackson Powers Johnson can play both positions. Granted, he can't do it at the same time. But as we saw at the senior ball, the one day that he played uh, and he was injured, I, I, he's just a tough, nasty guy. He's got a personality that, you know, they rub some people the wrong way sometimes. I don't care. I mean, you watch the film. He was good in 2022 at guard. He was outstanding in 2023 at center. Was terrific that one day of senior bowl practice when he was injured. And we see guys who basically bail on the senior bowl because they're injured. This guy played while injured, like the uh, tight end from Oregon State a year ago. So I think Miami Dolphins, this is fits this check so many boxes. Jackson Powers Johnson. All right, Eagles at 22, and Terry and Arnold still sitting there. Woo! This is a run to the podium. The Eagles need young cornerbacks uh, to eventually replace James Badbury and Darius Slay. I know they don't generally pick cornerbacks early. They like to pick big people, whether it's offensive linemen or defensive linemen. But eventually, you have to address that cornerback position, Tony. And I think Terry and Arnold's the easy pick here for the Eagles at 22. It'd be interesting because Tyler Guyton's still there. I mean, could they take Tyler Guyton? Uh, I mean, that is a Howie Roseman type type of pick, uh, Tyler Guyton. Yeah, and Lane who, Johnson's older, right? They're eventually going to have to replace him at right tackle. And when you look at Tyler Guyton, athletic, great upside, maybe a personality where he needs a boot in the rear end, that is the type of guy that, uh, that Howie Roseman likes. Uh but still, I, I mean, they do need corners. So Terry and Arnold is an outstanding pick. The Arizona Cardinals are on the clock. Uh, Jonah Williams, you know, Tyler Guyton's there, but they signed Jonah Williams. They got Paris Johnson. Cornerback is a need. You broke our hearts. I mean, we, we hit a home run with Malik Neighbors with that first pick. Uh, we would have liked a cornerback here. I think any cornerback is a slight reach. They need pass rushers. They select Chop Robinson, my guy. I, I think he's going to do he do a great job there. He's explosive. He's a great edge rusher. You can line him up in a three point stance. You can stand him up over tackle. I sound redundant saying these things about Chop Robinson, but since we couldn't get our cornerback here, the Cardinals, we're going to go with the pass rusher, and they take Chop Robinson. No, I like that pick. Dallas Cowboys at twenty four. Tony, they were throwing pens when Graham Barn and Jackson Powers Johnson went off the board because they need a starting center, and they were ready to just plug one of those guys right in there and, and go off and start their season. And that didn't work out. Now it is a fairly deep center class. You can get guys like Bo Limmer later. You can get um, guys like uh, Taylor Bartolini later or Zach Frazier if you trade up in the second round. So they have other options there. But you guy you mentioned for the Eagles at 22 – is still sitting there for the Cowboys at 24. And Tyron Smith going to the Jets. They can move Tyler Smith out to left tackle if they want, yeah. or they can leave him at left guard. And if they draft Tyler Guyton, they might be able to do just that. So they like to draft big, athletic, rangy tackles, and the Cowboys have done a good job of training those offensive linemen up and turning them into good players. So I think they're going to draft Tyler Guyton, 24th overall, uh, from Oklahoma. And again, I think they like drafting those Texas, Oklahoma guys too. So I think Guyton fits into that realm of possibilities for the Cowboys at 24. Big body guy. Like I said, just needs a, a boot in the rear end. And, you know, with some of those veterans on there, you hope that he'll be able to do that. The Green Bay Packers are on the clock. 
Uh, the Packers, they could use a tackle. They could use a cornerback. They could use a safety. As we talked about, there's no safety available. I'm going to go with Kool-Aid McKistry. I know a lot of people are all over the board on him. I talked to somebody who thinks it's, you know, he's more of a late first round pick. Well, we're moving into the late part of round one. I love his a bit. I love his size. I love his feistiness. Ran well at pro day, even though he's got the, uh, the foot issue. Now the foot issue will, will determine where he goes. If some teams think it's a, it's a medical issue and, you know, he may not be able to play for a while. Obviously McKistry is going to fall, but I think this is a good fit for a team that needs a cornerback. I like it. I think Tampa, they would pick an edge player here, Tony, if one was available, but I think we're all out of first round edge players. Maybe Darius Robinson. I think it's a little bit early for him. Um, So I'm going to go Nate Wiggins here. They need a corner. They traded Carlton Davis. Uh, They need a corner that can go in there. You know, they like to play man-to-man defense there. So I think Put him in there. They like the blitz. Put guys on islands. I think Nate Wiggins can cover on an island. So I'm going to give Wiggins to the Bucks at 26. Makes a lot of sense. And that would have been the guy that I would have selected for the Arizona Cardinals. You broke my heart twice by taking Terry and Arnold of Philadelphia and now taking Nate Wiggins. Oh, I did, huh? <laughs> uh, we got our receiver. We got our edge rusher. I mean, they still need a cornerback. Maybe they could use some help on the interior defensive line. They they did sign a lot of a bunch of players there in the offseason. I am going to go. With, How about Cooper DeGene, Tony? He's still go. around. There you go. I'm going to go with Cooper DeGene. I'm not as high on DeGene as other people are, but he's a big, strong, athletic guy. He's working out on April 8th. Uh, the injury has prevented him from working out at the pro day. The injury prevented him from working out the combine. I think even in a worst case scenario, Arizona, you can stick him inside at uh, at, at safety. I would have selected uh, Zerhan Newton at this point in time, but they put a lot of free agent money into that defensive line uh, in the offseason of the past month. So I'm going to go with Cooper DeGene. Hopefully, Philly need a cornerback. All right, Bill's at 28, Tony, and I think they could really use a second corner, but they're wiped out. Uh, they could go defensive line here. I think Johnny Newton could be an option here, but they have it all over there, so I'm not sure that's where they would go. So I'm going to go with what I would consider a luxury pick, Tony. You know, they lost Gabe Davis in free agency. They have Stefan Diggs, who's a, a really good mover, but they don't have that big-bodied, top-speed deep threat. Well, you know who's a big-bodied, top-speed deep threat? The fourth wide receiver in this draft class that has not been taken yet. So Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU to the Bears at 28. That makes perfect sense. I mean, he's a faster version of Gabe Davis. I think he's being undervalued. I think the fact that, you know, he had he played by Malik Neighbors, reduced his opportunities. He's coming off a great season. I absolutely love Ryan Thomas. It would not surprise me if two or three years down the road, in the right situation, like with a Josh Allen, he turns into one of the best receivers or, or is as good as the best receivers in this draft. The Detroit Lions are on the board, and Detroit did an outstanding job in free agency, filling many of their needs uh, on the offensive line, filling their needs at cornerback, uh, filling their needs on the defensive line. You know, I'm looking at the board right now. Jordan Morgan, not really because they've got a good offensive line. I'm going to go with a Donnie Mitchell of uh, Texas here, because I I think the more receivers that you give Jared Goff, the more weapons, the more, uh, the the more lethal you make them. Obviously, you know, they've got a decent running game. You're not going to draft a running back this early, but I think, you know, with with, uh, Jamison Williams there and Amon St. Brown, Mitchell brings the size and the consistency. He's just got to learn to play with it every single down. Got to learn to play the way he did as a freshman at Georgia. I, I think this is, not really a luxury pick, but I think that the Lions did such an outstanding job in free agency, they can go in this direction. Yeah, I agree. And I thought about picking Mitchell ahead of Thomas, but I thought Thomas was a better fit with the Bills there. So that's where I went in that direction. I have heard that there are some concerns about how much longer Frank Ragnow is going to play. He was kind of held together with duct tape at the end of last year. So I don't know, maybe a Zach Frazier type could be a possibility here, but he would have to sit a year before he would go in and play. So I'm with you. I, th- I think Mitchell is a good pick. Ravens at 30, Tony. Well, they lost their starting right tackle, their starting guard, 
And you know who's a starting right tackle or guard in this draft that hasn't been picked yet and is maybe the top player left on my board overall? That's Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. I think this is an easy pick. You slide him in. You can play him at guard. You can play him at tackle. I'm all about it. Jordan Morgan to the Ravens at 30. And I've been told that the, that the Ravens do believe that Jordan Morgan can play right tackle. I, I mean, I have to question it based on what we saw at the senior ball, but he's athletic. He's, he's got some growth uh, growth potential, and, and he's he's an athletic guy who moves well. San Francisco 49ers are on the board. They lost a lot of players on that interior defensive line this year. They signed Malik Collins. It's basically a Band-Aid type of uh, signing for a year. I'm going to go with a guy who people have seemingly forgotten about in Zerhan Newton. I mean, he's a guy who's a high-energy player. He played hard all year at Illinois, even when the outcome of the game was known and his team was losing. He's had some injuries, uh, was which has prevented him from uh, working out in the lead-up to the draft. But I think this is a good fit with an outstanding player, really somebody in Newton that a lot of us thought early in the process, last October, could be a top 15 pick. He falls all the way to 31 for the San Francisco 49ers. They fill a need with an outstanding player. All right, and then the Chiefs at 32, Tony. Uh, I think they could use a corner to replace Legereus Sneed, but they've done a good job of drafting corners later and uh, picking those guys up. And I really think all the top corners are wiped out at this point. I think it's a little too early for a, a Kamari Lassiter or a TJ Tampa um, uh Bo Melton, not Bo Melton, uh, uh, Melton from Max Syracuse, Melton. Uh, from, from, from Rutgers, Max Melton, thank you, his brother. Um, I think it's a little too early for that next group. And Tony, look, they need an offensive tackle. They really do. Sadly, I killed myself by picking Jordan Morgan at 30, and no one else is left, really, that I love here. So I'm going to do a little bit of a reach for my taste, but I love the player. I love his tape. I think he has a lot of upside. Uh, and he's played both the right and the left side, which I think will help the Chiefs in terms of where they're at. Uh, I'm going to go Kingsley Suamataya out of BYU. I think there's a fairly large drop-off once you get past him to the Patrick Paul Rosengarten tier of offensive tackles. And the Chiefs don't pick again for, for 32 picks, obviously. So I'm going to go Kingsley Suamataya with that final first-round pick to the Kansas City Chiefs. On film... This makes all the sense in the world. You could say that Sumataya probably should go, you know, could legitimately go six to seven picks earlier. There's some questions about maturity, uh, some other issues with him. But, you know, if he focuses on football and he makes football priority, this could be a knockout pick for the Chiefs. But you never know with the Chiefs. I mean, they took the kid from Kansas State last year who was a second round pick at the end of the first round. So I would say that, and let me also tell you that I'm told that Sumatai has uh, made an official visit to see the Chiefs, and it went incredibly well, which leads me to believe, you know, say that, yeah, he's op- uh, it's got to be in play. But you never know with the Chiefs. They took the kid from um, Kansas State at the end of the first round in 2023. I-, I don't think that would prevent them from taking a Patrick Paul this early because that's the way they roll. They think that Paul is, you know, has got more upside. Obviously, Xavier Worthy, you know, another playmaker, a field stretcher. But I, I would agree. I, I, on, when you look at the film, when you look at the player himself, when you look at the potential value, this makes the most sense. tie makes the most sense. And I think they have a much better chance of getting a good wide receiver at the end of round two and then a corner and three than they do getting a tackle that late. So real quick summary here, Tony. I'm not going to go through all the picks, uh, but I will summarize it briefly. So we have four quarterbacks, the first four picks in the draft, but no quarterbacks after that. So no Penix or Bo Nix. I wonder in real life if a team would try to trade into the first round to get one of those guys, but it didn't happen here. So four quarterbacks, first four picks, no quarterbacks after that. I'm going to count the offensive line, and people love counting on podcasts. It's great content. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 offensive linemen of the first 32 picks. So more than a third of the first round pick, Tony, offensive linemen. In terms of number of defensive players, let's see. You have Newton one, DeGene, Niggin, Wiggins three, McKinstry four, Robinson five, Arnold six, Murphy seven, Latu eight, Burse nine, Turner ten. 
Did I count Mitchell there? Uh, did you put Chop Robinson in there? Yeah, it's either 10 or 11 defensive players. So only more, almost as many or more offensive linemen than we had defensive players. And I think that's how this first line, this, this is how this first round is going to go. I mean, it makes sense. We've been talking about, you know, the rich crop of offensive tackles, eight offensive tackles potentially going around one. I think Graham Barton has added that extra offensive lineman into the first round with his performance at Pro Day, and he, he checked off a lot of boxes. Uh, so it makes an, an incredible amount of sense. Listen, you got four quarterbacks going with the first four selections. You better protect those quarterbacks, or you better protect the quarterback that you have, uh, you know, playing b- uh, behind center. So it just makes sense that these teams, you know, are going to have to draft offensive linemen. You, you know, somebody – there aren't too many starting left tackles in the league that weren't first round picks. Uh, so that's why I believe as we've talked about all along, you're going to see a ton of offensive tackles going the round one. That's why we had it in our mock draft. Yeah. 11 defensive guys and 11 offensive tackles. We had five wide receivers go with the tight end and the quarterbacks, no safeties, no running backs, right. no linebackers. And that's, and that's the way the board shapes up. Now, you know, the linebackers, what is a linebacker? You know, is, is lat to a linebacker? He's an edge rusher that can also play up the line of scrimmage. Same with Chuck Robinson. Right. It's just a transformation of that position. But, it, you know, as we talked about at the start of the show, as we talked about for weeks now, your first running back and safeties aren't going to come off the board until the earliest, the bottom half of round two. So any running back or any safety within the first 45 selections is going to be a reach. Tony, I love, I think this mock draft was really realistic, to be honest with you. There were some surprises. Like, I'm sure nobody thought neighbors in a doomsday would get to 10 and 11, but I understand how it's possible with the way this went down. So I think it's a realistic mock draft, but it's also slightly different than ones we've seen out there. I think this was a good exercise. I enjoyed this. We'll have one more of these the week of the draft. A doomsday or neighbors will get to 10 or 11 if that fourth quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, moves into the top eight. If that happens, Bowers, Neighbors, Dunze, not all of them, but two of the three of them, I believe, will be available, picks 10 or 11, unless somehow uh, somebody offers the Falcons uh, a ton of draft picks to move up and get one of the pass catchers. Tony, always a pleasure. We'll be back with our top 10 lists on offense next week, and we'll rock and roll. Appreciate the time as always, my friend. Thanks, John. Draft season is underway. We're... Th- In the sprint, three weeks to go, this show was brought to you by Moody's, our proud sponsor. We appreciate them sponsoring our podcast, Decode Risk, Unlock Opportunity, Moody's. Make sure you visit Moody's.com to learn more. For Tony Pauline from Sports Kita, I am John Schmuck from the New York Football Giants. Of course, you can find Draft Season on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe. Or you can find it on the Giants mobile app or Giants.com slash podcast. You can find our other podcasts like Big Blue Kickoff Live and the Giants Huddle, where we've been doing a lot of draft interviews, folks. The Giants Huddle podcast, it might be a Giants podcast, but we're doing all draft stuff this month. We had some great interviews. Make sure you go check that out if you're into that sort of thing. For Tony Pauline, I'm John Schmelk. We will see you next time, everybody. 